great. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. And, and thanks for allowing me to present virtually today. Um, I know that uh, I, in an ideal world, I would be uh, right there with you guys. Uh, but today, I'm going to be a talking head, uh, walking you through my presentation. And so that I'm not just one single talking head uh, talking at you, I also have with me one of my graduate students, Aaron Frankel, and he's a master's student in Latin and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Minnesota, and he's been doing a lot of the hard work collecting data and analyzing some of the nitrogen data that we have. So I'm going to give you guys a quick introduction to the project first, and then I will hand it over to Aaron to talk about some of our findings. So yeah, this project, um, the big picture is looking at differences in, in soil carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus after drainage installation. And, um, and we are located uh, about six hours north of where you guys are at, at the Northwest Research and Outreach Center in Crookston. So that's where all of this uh, research takes place. And the idea behind this uh, project was, you know, to not just do a drainage experiment on the plot scale, but to really do drainage at the field scale. And uh, the director of the Research and Outreach Center um, at the time, Albert Sims, was gracious enough to uh, indulge my crazy ideas and let me drain part of a 60 acre field uh, that the university owns as part of the Research and Outreach Center system and use that as the basis of this experiment. So the goals of this project, the overall goals of this project are to look at how a new drainage installation alters soil organic matter depletion, nitrogen cycling, and phosphorus cycling uh, over a two over time. Uh, started out with a two-year period, but we're going to keep going with this uh, even longer. Um, and we have objectives related to carbon and especially that soil organic matter, uh, nitrogen mineralization and phosphorus. We're kind of looking at all three nutrients and potentially how those interact. So why do we care? Well, drainage installation, um, while it's a little bit more common in southern Minnesota, it is growing in the northwest part of the state. And drainage changes where living organisms can persist. And so as we change the water table, we are changing where those microbes can live and, and what metabolism they're using. They can they can metabolize nitrogen if they have oxygen or if they don't, but they use different sources uh, for, for their metabolism and for their food, depending on whether or not they do have oxygen. So we've seen some examples um, in the literature lately, um, especially by Fabian himself, uh, that looking at installing drainage could potentially disrupt the balance of carbon pools. So, and that obviously has rippling effects onto nitrogen losses and potentially to phosphorus losses as well. So this is just another overall scheme, another view of this field and this design that we have. Uh, we have this broken, this 60 acre plot broken up into four different sections of about equal area, about 15 acres each. Um, the first and the third sections have tile drainage installation and the other two we are keeping undrained for now um, to act as a pair. And this installation started, we started this installation back in the fall of 2019. And to bring you guys back in time a little bit, um, in complete contrast to the year we just had, fall 2019 was um, very wet, very rainy fall. And, um, you know, one of the, if you've heard me speak about this before, then you've heard me say that it was even too wet to tile drain um, in this field in fall 2019. But we did manage to get the field uh, tiled and get this experiment off the ground, um, even though it was, a, it was, you know, took a lot of effort and took tractors to pull the drain plows uh, through the mud, we got the installation in. And just to kind of set up the next couple of slides, I wanted to show everybody the difference in rainfall that we had in Crookston measured at the research center uh, between 2020 and 2021. One thing to orient you all to this graph is that I have started the year in September of each year because 
that is kind of when I've realized we start banking water for the next growing season um, in Northwest Minnesota. So we started off in fall 2019 with very, very wet rainfall conditions. And then that continued through the winter, you know, everything freezes, it stays, all that moisture stays in the soil. And then we had, we followed that up with a very, very wet spring. Now turn the clock one year in fall of 2020, September 2020, you can see we had just a fraction of the precipitation that we had the previous year. And so then going into spring of 2021, this last spring, um, and the drought, we had very little soil moisture left um, and very little rainfall once, once the rain stopped in 2020. And just as a reminder, you know, that fall of 2019 is the same time we did this drainage installation. So kind of the whole first year of our drainage, we had uh, mo very heavy moisture conditions. And then the second year of its life, very, very dry conditions. So everything kind of that we're going to talk about today has a bit of a caveat to it, that these are two very extreme years. And uh, before I hand this over to Erin to talk about some of the data, I did want to show visually some of the things we saw with yield. And um, we can get into a little bit more of the science-y data later, but I did think there were some interesting things just visually uh, to point out with this data. In 2019, we had wheat. This was, again, the year that um, we installed the drain. So just as kind of our pre-drainage uh, pre yields, uh, we had, you know, a fairly standard yield and all across that field. If you look closely at those yields, it's it's pretty much, you know, all across the field seems to be showing similar patterns. Um, and then in 2020 was our very, very wet year. Uh, we grew soybeans that year. Um, so you can see some soybean stand. And what we realized in 2020 was that the, especially since we were wet early and soybeans don't like to have wet feet, um, we definitely saw some patchiness uh, in the soybeans stand, uh, you know, whether that was, you know, they were standing in a surface ditch um, or if they were in areas that were heavily compacted. So one of the things on this slide in that middle kind of yield graph off the combine, uh, you can see some horizontal lines, horizontal red lines cutting uh, east to west across that image. And what those lines are showing is actually the patterns of our surface drains uh, in that field. So you can see where we had low spots and where we had poor yield. Now, to contrast that in 2021, um, visually you can't see the same kind of uh, disruption in uh, stand establishment for wheat as you could see in the soybeans. Um, but we did have a lot of cracking in the field. We had definitely experienced you know, some major impacts from the drought and, um, and really didn't get enough rain to quite finish off that wheat crop like we would like. And, um, and then what we see in that third image on the bottom right hand side is you actually do see some potentially slightly lower yields uh, showing up in our drained sections during this drought year. Um, and we're going to get into a little bit of why that may be the case. But uh, for now, I will turn it over to Aaron. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, so thanks, Lindsay, for that. Um, and uh, now taking those photos and kind of looking at the actual data here, um, on the left-hand side, you can see um, some notes there about uh, what we were looking at. So in 2019, um, we had a higher precipitation year. We were growing wheat. Um, as you can see there, um, in blue, uh, we have the undrained section. In yellow, we have the drained section. And so we have a pretty nice overlap of yield um, between both the drained and the undrained section. So this is prior to drainage installation. It makes sense that we're having um, the same yield in those, uh, in those sections, um, both the drained and undrained. But when we get to 2020, um, we start to see the impacts of the drainage system kind of coming into, um, into our yield results. And so as you can see, the um, drain section has higher yield there for our soybeans, um, you know, because that, that uh, tile drainage system is beginning to work and is removing excess water uh, from the soil profile. 
And then in 2021, we see the opposite happening with our wheat yield. We see um, actually that the drain section had uh, lower yield than the undrained section. Um, and as Lindsay talked about, those are due to our kind of our drought conditions. Basically, um, there was extra water basically being stored in those uh, undrained sections, allowing for the wheat to have a higher yield there. Um, and so it's interesting um, because we're kind of seeing that that um, that drainage system is making our yield a little bit more consistent. Um, and so there's less variation between the years in those drain fields opposed to those undrained fields, which has a little bit more wide variety um, depending on our uh, precipitation. And so um, as precipitation is, is can be a lot more variable um, in the coming decades, you know, where our, our drainage system is helping us get a little bit more consistent yields. All right. Okay. And, you know, some of the other data that we collected is looking at um, the soil uh, concentrations of nitrogen that are um, out there in the field. And we collect these once every season. So in the fall, in the, in the fall um, after harvest, in the spring before we plant, and then one data point in the middle of the summer. And so next, then Aaron's going to tell you a little bit about what we found for inorganic nitrogen. Yeah, so this is taking a look at kind of nitrate um, uh, between the years 2020 and 2021. So we sampled these um, in the spring prior to planting. Um, and so this graph is, is a little bit um, a little bit strange, so I'll explain it here. And so this is the change in nitrogen between the two years, uh, inorganic nitrogen, excuse me. And so in 2020, uh, that's a residual from wheat production. And 2021, that's a residual from soybean production. So we have lower, um, to the left-hand side of that horizontal line, we have lower inorganic nitrogen following soybean production than wheat production, um, which makes sense because um, we didn't apply uh, no, no application in 20 uh, prior, or during that soybean um, season. But what's interesting is that um, our inorganic nitrogen is um, being lost mostly in the upper 30 centimeters. So as you can see there, the difference between the drained and undrained sections, we actually have much lower um, inorganic nitrogen in the drain section, just in the upper 30 centimeters. But then as we move further down, uh, down to kind of 60 to 90 centimeters, we actually have pretty similar, almost exactly the same um, nitrate levels um, between the drained and the undrained sections. And so we know that this drainage, um, the insulation of the drainage system has caused losses of inorganic nitrogen. And we know that these losses are kind of happening in the upper 30 centimeters. So we're interested in kind of uncovering what are the mechanics of why that's actually happening in the upper 30 centimeters, but not um, deeper down in the soil profile. All right, and some of the other data that we're collecting to try to answer that question is looking at the greenhouse gas emissions that are coming from the soil. And basically what this measurement does is you put a round you know, PVC pipe with a lid in the soil and so you cap it off and you see how the concentration of different gases inside that capped chamber changes over time. And that can tell you about what the microbes are respiring, um, what they're potentially using as their energy source. And, um, and so we are looking at that as, you know, how, how does the drainage influence what, um, what gases are being emitted? And again, we're kind of collecting this, uh, we collect this all throughout the summer. Yeah, so taking a look at the actual data, so unfortunately, um, due to um, a machine being down, we don't have data yet from 2021. Um, so we're looking forward to kind of seeing the 2021 data. Um, but we have one year of data here in 2020. Um, and here is in yellow is the drained sections and in blue is the undrained sections and this is nitrous oxide flux. And so what we do know, um, at different points throughout the growing season, we had higher nitrous oxide fluxes in the drained and um, in other parts of the season, we had higher in the undrained, depending on kind of the water levels um, in the soil and the moisture. Um, and so what we do know is this is definitely a, sor a major source of kind of, of, of nitrogen loss in our, in our system. We know that there is significant amount being lost um, to gas 
Um, and we're curious kind of to see going forward, um, does that change, does that continue to happen um, over, the, over the years? Do we continue to see um, nitrous oxide as being a big source of losses, depending on how the drained um, sections um, kind of move towards equilibrium? The other pathway we're looking at as far as nutrient losses is, of course, what's happening in the tile drainage water and the surface water. So one thing that makes our drainage systems design a little bit different from what you would see on a farmer's field is that we actually do have two lift stations working to pump water um, from our drainage system. The one that's closest to you in this image is uh, our is for the subsurface tile drainage. Um, and we have a totally separate lift station. That's the one that's behind it that's not pumping. That is for surface runoff. And really the only reason we did that, um, if this was a farmer's field, those would all come together into one uh, lift station. But for our purposes, we were interested in looking at specifically what was happening on surface pathways compared to what was happening for our subsurface pathways. So we separated those two streams of water out. And and what we collect on those, we do collect how often those pumps are pumping and how much water we're losing um, in each of these pathways. Uh, but we also collect uh, daily water samples at these plots. And um, the inside the gray tub that you see uh, in this image is an automated sampler and it collects, it automatically pumps out of the bottom of the lift station uh, once every six hours and then we composite that daily. Um, so we have a daily record of all the concentrations of water that we can then pair with our pumping data to get a nutrient load. And of course we then take those samples inside and analyze them in our lab for we look at uh, total nitrogen, nitrates, uh, total phosphorus, and dissolved reactive phosphorus. And we also look at ammonia as well. Yeah, so taking a look at our uh, nitrogen concentrations coming out of both our surface um, and our tile lines, um, we see some interesting patterns that are pretty closely tied um, to precipitation patterns. So obviously 2021, um, was a year that, you know, we didn't get a lot of water until basically starting until September uh, and October. And so um, what we see there is we see actually pretty steady concentrations um, in our, in, uh, in the surface, uh, particularly in uh, 2021 because of that. Um, and what is happening is that nitrate is following the precipitation patterns a little bit more. So we see those spikes in, nitri in nitrate, we see more leaching following those precipitation events. And so we see a steadiness in 2020, um, in 2021 until we get to those kind of later months uh, in which we see kind of spikes um, in concentration when we do get those bigger rainfall events, um, which didn't really occur until late summer, early fall for us um, in Northwest Minnesota. And once again here, this is um, a, a graph looking at um, loads um, in uh, 2020 and 2021. Um, and so in 2020, um, uh, or I guess I'll, I'll ask you to look at the axes here. Basically, um, the loads in, or the y-axis here, in 2020, we were having um, more substantial um, more substantial loads um, because of our, we had higher discharge just because it was a higher precipitation year. Um, and then in 2021, we had extremely low loads um, basically the entire time just because there was very low or there was much uh, very low precipitation the entire year. Um, and one thing that's interesting about and why our loads are, are, are fairly low in general is we have these lift stations that um, collect a ton of a lot of water and then they only pump um, they're not like, like a gravity outlet, which is constantly um, releasing water. Um, these lift stations hold water for a long time. Um, and so they control the amount of water leaving the system. And when there's not a lot of water, they're less likely to pump. And therefore our loads are even lower than kind of your typical um, farm field that is just has gravity outlets um, in their tile lines. And here is looking at the forms of nitrogen loss. And so um, in the more green shades, we have the surface. And in the more blue shades um, on the bottom half, we have, um, we have tile lines. And what's interesting here, in the, on the left-hand side, we see 2020. 
um, from May to October. And on the right-hand side, we see May to October of 2021. Um, and as you can see on the left-hand side, when we have a lot of precipitation, like we did in 2020, um, the amount, the, uh, the tile nitrate is, is, our, is often our biggest uh, fraction of nitrogen loss. And so that makes sense. We're leaching a lot um, from the soil profile um, when we do have those high precipitation. Then we get to 2021, the surface um, is actually a much larger proportion. The surface nitrate um, is actually a much bigger proportion of our losses because we have that low, um, we had the lower precipitation. And so not much is getting into our tile lines. Um, and then that kind of picks up a little bit more. We have a little bit more in August, September, and October once again, and that's kind of when our precipitation in, um, increased um, substantially. And so what else are we looking at? And so we didn't, we didn't kind of share everything with nit about nitrogen today, um, but one thing we're also looking at is mineralization rates. So what is the impact of drainage systems on mineralization rates? Um, and so how is that going to impact kind of th our thinking about our nutrient application? And also what are different forms of soil nitrogen losses? So we're also interested in looking at some of the organic forms of nitrogen um, and the movement between organic and inorganic forms of nitrogen uh, and how that changes the drainage. And also plant uptake of nitrogen. So how, how are plants kind of um, changing how they uptake our uptake nitrogen with drainage uh, versus without it? And so in the end, hopefully all these pieces together are gonna hopefully help us create some partial nitrogen budgets and help us quantify kind of where we lose the most nitrogen um, so we can begin to think about how these drainage systems are gonna impact our nutrient management um, in some. And so um, basically, um, I kind of talked about a little bit about these things uh, already, but we, you know, we wanna be able to provide recommendations to uh, growers in Northwest Minnesota and the Red River Valley. And so what we're gonna take with, from these results is we are gonna uh, take these results and do some nitrogen uh, rate trials next. And so we wanna be able to give really specific recommendations to growers, especially in those first couple of years, um, you know, cause the installation of these drainage systems, you know, greatly disrupts um, dis disrupts the soil and impacts those microbial communities. So we're interested in looking at those first couple of years and kind of thinking about how do we need to change our nu nutrient application when we do install drainage. So that's kind of the next step for this project. Um, up on those fields in uh, Northwest Minnesota. Yeah, and I'll just uh, give a quick thank you uh, to our sponsors and to uh, all the people that have been working with us on this project. You know, we have partnered a lot with Dr. Anna Cates, who's the Minnesota Soil Health Specialist, and actually Dr. Katie Chapman as well. She's a professor at the University of Minnesota Crookston. So this is ended up being a kind of a cross campus uh, effort here between, you know, 10 cities, Crookston, uh, research and outreach centers, and we've had quite a few students uh, helping us along the way. Um, and so thanks to everyone. And uh, here's my contact information and Aaron's. Um, and I believe if we have time, we can then switch to uh, answering some of your questions. Lindsay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. This is Bruce Montgomery. I'm the moderator. I'll pass the mic around if we have any questions in the audience. And I guess if we get some online, I'll, I don't know if you'll be able to see them, but I'll read them to you if we get them. Does anybody in the crowd have any questions? Okay, we got a couple online ones, Lindsay. Sure, I'll go ahead and okay, start. Can you see those? I can, yes. You can, okay. Yeah, the first question on the top, in the Red River Valley, is tile drainage installation a profitable decision to improve crop yields? Well, that question's really on point. That is one of the questions that we are hoping to be able to answer. I, I really went into this project expecting, I do expect to see that this is a profitable decision moving forward. Um, there's been research that's happened, um, you know, from North Dakota State University and from other places in Minnesota that does show that this is a profitable decision. So I'm hoping, you know, once we take this project a little bit further north, that uh, we'll see similar results. And I think our, our results for 2020 were really promising. Um, you know, it was a wet year. We did see increased yields 
um, in the drained portions. Now, what we saw with wheat in um, you know 2021, it was a drought, um, is maybe a little bit of an anomaly. And I've actually heard some anecdotal evidence of, of other folks, um, you know, either seeing no difference or possibly increased yields in their tiled fields um, even during a drought. So, you know, that is we just have two years of data, but we are hoping uh, to be able to answer that more definitively in the future. And the next question is the water uh, collected in the sample tank, sampled every six hours from that day, or is it held in the tile pump station for more than a day before it's pumped to the tank? Let's see, there's a lot in that question. So yeah, so we do, um, the water collected in the sample tank is um, not emptied. So there is kind of a potentially a sort of a, a backup effect, um, you know, in the water could be held for more than a day, could also be not held for more than a day if we're getting a lot of pumping. But, you know, one of the reasons why Aaron had concentrations to talk about for 2021 is even though we weren't pumping, there was still a little bit of water um, at the bottom of the lift station. So looking at concentration data alone, I always caution people is, is maybe not the, the end all for uh, thinking about water quality. Um, what really we're looking at is, you know, for the potential impact downstream. And so eventually when that water does start pumping, um, it will be released to the environment. So, you know, any transformations that are happening to that water as it sits in the tank, um, you know, we want to be able to capture that and know uh, what's happening. So it is kind of a good, it's a good reflection of what's being pumped out on that particular day. Um, but there are certainly things happening uh, to that water between the time when it comes from the field and when it sits in the tank. Now, the tank is covered, so you know it's not getting additional input. So I hope I, yeah, Aaron, do you have? Yeah, and also um, we, during a lot of these periods in 2021, when we were getting no precipitation, you know, we were still sampling every, every, every day, every six hours and um, very little changes in the concentrations over, over time. So, you know, in a, in a week span, we we're, we're getting pretty similar Similar um, kind of concentrations. It's not changing very much as it's sitting there in the tank um, when we know we have no inputs there. So, okay, is the research on if loss of nitrogen changes with and without tile? And again, this is sort of one of those questions we are hoping to answer. And you know, even though we don't have the the surface runoff kind of split from the different pot plots uh, for these first couple of years. Once we start moving into the future, we will be kind of catching that surface runoff as it comes between the plots. And so we will be able to kind of differentiate um, at least to some level what's happening on the individual plots. Um, but, you know, the tile, what we're seeing so far you know, potentially what we might be seeing. Um, we are hoping to at least partially answer that question with the analysis Aaron's doing. Okay, the next question, how might lateral groundwater movement between plots confound your results and interpretations? This is again, this is a good question. This is from somebody who has done some thinking about uh, drainage uh, design and experimentation, I can tell, um, because that is always a concern that water could be moving from the undrained sections to the drained sections. We don't have any barriers really blocking off, you know, one plot from another. But at the same time, you know, we have 50 foot spacings out there and we're dealing with a really large scale of plots. So once you get to that scale, I mean, yes, there's going to be some effect, but I think the effect is sort of minimal um, at this particular scale that we're looking at the data. Okay, this next question, how might your ongoing research account for testing the tile drainage system over a few years once the soil develops better pathways in the soil to the tile? Yeah, so one of the things we're doing is really we're establishing a baseline um, of, of losses and nitrogen mineralization and all of these pathways, we're, we're really establishing a baseline right now. And that's why all of those four plots are dealt with almost exactly, well, not almost, they're dealt with exactly the same way. The farm 
manages that whole 60 acre field as one unit. So that really what we're, we're going to be seeing over time is the recovery of the soil um, after that massive soil disturbance that we had in fall of 2019 and uh, how the soil may recover over time. And, um, and I will add, I do think that's one of my hypotheses for why we may have seen the lower yields um, in our wheat, even in our drought year. I mean, there definitely was lower soil moisture, especially at the beginning of the season, but we also may have been seeing some of the effects of the massive soil disturbance uh, from previous years because there hasn't been time for the soil structure to rebound. Okay, will subsurface drainage lead to the ability for producers to reduce tillage and do no-till, whereas traditional conventional deep tillage is required for Minnesota soil types to aid spring warm-up? And yes, this is something that um, that actually there's the publication, one of the few drainage publications that uh, we've that we've had before I came up here um, to the university from about 20 years ago, they did look at soil temperatures in different drain spacing plots and found that the soil temperatures were a few degrees warmer in the drained plots than the undrained plots. So having those extra couple of days to warm up the soil might you know, might be relevant when you're dealing with such a short growing season. So I do think that that is a, a possibility of, of what we could see. Now we're not necessarily overlaying any tillage treatments onto this trial to really dig into that question. But, you know, I, I do think the temperature is going to uh, help. Okay, any thoughts on what might happen long term with nitrogen and phosphorus cycling with drainage? Yeah, well, I've answered a lot of questions. Aaron, do you want to answer? Do you want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, I, I guess I uh, um, the long term. I guess I don't know exactly what I think is going to happen because I there are results from some long term drainage trials um, in Indiana and in Iowa. There's some results from there about nitrogen. Um, I'm curious what's going to happen up in Northwest Minnesota. We have a very different soil type than in a lot of places in the state and in much of um, some of the other places in the Upper Midwest. I mean, I'm most curious. I don't know exactly. I'm most curious to see. Um, what, what losses are going to happen due to greenhouse gas emissions and see if we're going to have kind of a trade-off um, there, if we're going to be um, having less emissions, um, less greenhouse gas emissions, less losses of nitrous oxide um, in the uh, drained sections, but kind of more losses through the tile drains um, and kind of more losses of inorganic nitrogen uh, that would require kind of um, more um, higher levels of nutrient application. Um, phosphorus, Lindsay, that's, that's all yours, but... <laughs> sure, yeah. And with phosphorus, I'm really curious as to how, you know, these potential changes that we see in carbon and nitrogen, you know, might in some ways affect the phosphorus avail availability too. Um, it's it's kind of uh, something that's not been looked at a whole lot is, is the three nutrients interacting with one another. But I think, you know, I think it's something that since we're collecting the data would be great to take a look at. With phosphorus cycling, I don't know that I necessarily expect too much to change um, really from a kind of a physical perspective uh, of the soils and the cycles themselves. But what I do expect to see is, you know, lower loads from our drained plots, because if we add subsurface drainage, we'll reduce the amount of surface runoff, ideally. Um, and then that would lead to, you know, lower concentrations, um, lower phosphorus losses, um, as like in total. So that's what I'm hoping to see long term uh, on the phosphorus side. All right, our next question. What is the drainage study helper Corgi's name? Well, that is a great question. The Corgi is, is my Corgi. Her name is uh, Herbert and she's a great research assistant and she loved helping out over the summers as much as she could. Um, and yes, obviously I put her in the presentations as much as I can. 
<laughs> and the last question we have here, would you expect changes in soil organic carbon due to drainage? Any insights from your data? Well, I actually might pass this one to Aaron too, because Aaron works very closely with another graduate student. This is central to, to Kyle Sherbine's work and Aaron and Kyle spend a lot of hours uh, in the field and in the lab uh, working right next to each other. So maybe Aaron can answer this one. Yeah, and so this is kind of one of the parts uh, that we didn't talk about at all in our presentation and it is that um, there is just as I, I'm the graduate student working on nitrogen, there is a graduate student working specifically just on carbon. Um, and what he's looking at is different uh, kind of fractions of organic matter and seeing how those kind of change over time. So what types of organic matter um, are being lost due to um, drainage? Um, and I mean, generally speaking, um, you, you would expect your organic carbon stocks to decrease. Um, but which stocks are decreasing can kind of vary. Um, and so I guess um, I don't have the, the specifics on that, but I think like um, Kyle will be like presenting that data at some point, hopefully at a, at a conference similar to this um, about what types of, um, what types of um, organic matter and carbon are being lost um, with drainage. But generally speaking, you would expect your soil organic carbon stocks to decrease with, uh, with drainage. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody. And thanks, uh, Fabian, for setting it up so that we could present to you uh, virtually. And um, yeah, and hope to see you all in person, uh, possibly in the future or next year, uh, if that's the way it goes. <laughs> well, thank you, Lindsay and Aaron.